All right, and we're right. back, guys. Episode six of the Reptile Hangouts podcast. Your wonderful co-host, Charles, as always. You got my brother Nick over here at Gecko Galaxy and Gabriel down there with DIY Reptile Keeper. Make sure you check those two guys out. Here we are today. What's the U.S. Arc, Nick? What is that place? How's that work? Uh, U.S. Arc is uh, it's, it's quite interesting. So, uh, as always, I'm going to plug U.S. Arc. U.S. Arc is the only organization in the United States that is fighting for our rights to be able to keep these animals. Uh, there's constantly uh, ever-changing legislation that they're fighting against uh, to make it so that we have the right to keep the pets that we want to keep. So, go to usarc.org. There is a link down in the description if you cannot find it. And uh, consider becoming a member. It's very inexpensive, you know, for the price that you pay for a cup of coffee a day. If you go out for coffee, you can support the cause. Uh, another what are you doing this weekend? Have... Ah, this weekend. Yes, that is my hey. secondary shout out. He got me. Uh, so this weekend I'm vending a reptile expo, um, which uh, a lot of us do. Uh, but I, I live in West Virginia. And uh, I'm vending what I consider to be the premier expo in the state currently. Um, it's the Tri-State Exotic Animal Expo. Uh put on by my good friend Sean Alexander, um, and it is an excellent expo, so definitely check them out on Facebook. Uh, you'll be able to find the link for their Facebook down in the description also. So if you find yourself in the area at some point, or if you live in West Virginia, check out the Tri-State Exotic Animal Expo. All right, guys. So here we are. Episode 6, All Things New Caledonian. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and just a, a quick little uh, note, what is New Caledonia? Well, here we are. New Caledonia is uh, often referred to as quite a biodiversity hotspot. It's a large archipelago um, off the, I'm sorry, <clears throat> off the eastern coast of Australia. It's governed by France. Um, it consists of both uh, rain and dry ecoregions. So, um, and those are uh, rain and dry forest ecoregions. Sorry, I left that out. Um, and through my reading, I found a little fun fact that appears there are no native amphibians or mammals to this uh, archipelago. Now, that is, of course, with the exception of a few bat species oh, and the humans that live there now. But, uh, you know, originally. So that, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But um, uh, however, back on to the topic of the show, which brings us to three main animals. We got Corolophus ciliatus. We got Rachidactylus lichianus. And we got... Rachidactylus auriculatus, and those are going to be the main three species of topic tonight. Uh, that's genus and species for you police out there. But um, so we're going to talk about these beautiful creatures. And um, these guys can mainly be found on the main island of Grand Terre, uh, Grand Terre excuse me, um, and then a small island off the coast uh, commonly referred to as Pine Island. Now, you got to keep in mind there's a bunch of little small islands peppered around uh, you know, the main island of Grand Terre, and these animals are kind of going to overlap. Um, but quite honestly, I don't know what they're all called. So that's going to take a long time if we had to go through all of the list of every little speck of an island. But there's a lot more out there than just those two. So um, that's our little background on New Caledonia. So uh, let's talk about some geckos. Let's do geckos. Geckos right. are Fun. So we'll jump into uh, what we'll start Corlopus off with. Ciliatus. Yeah, we'll start the off with what is definitely the biggest one, um, at least in the hobby. It's sort of overtaken the hobby. If you go to Reptile Expos, uh, you know that you see two things. You see ball pythons and you see crested geckos. Uh, they are everywhere. Um, and me and Gabe um, and now CJ as well, he's introduced to them. He's got one. Um, we all keep these at some level. Um they're a pretty interesting species for sure, no doubt about it. Uh, they were first described in New Caledonia um, during the original French colonization back in 1866. And uh, they were not observed after that for a very, very long time, over 100 years. Yeah, uh, they were, actually, they were extinct. thought to be extinct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah they were That's rediscovered right. yeah. in, uh, in, in like what, 94 or 1994, after a tropical yep. storm. Yeah, they, they found them again. Um, and it was uh, some time after that that they were first brought into the country um, by uh, – I'm looking at the wrong thing uh, – that they were first brought <laughs> brought into the country, uh, this country and Europe. There were a small number that were collected uh, for captive breeding purposes and captive study purposes, uh, and they, uh, they brought them into Europe and the United States. And um, they are – 
extraordinarily popular in the hobby now and extraordinarily diverse in their phenotypes. So how they yeah, look. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's kind of crazy because it's been almost 30 years and it's like, it, you got to imagine that when they brought yeah. these things over here, it was just like, this is a crested, a crested gecko. Like this is what it looks like. And now here we are with all types of, of different uh, phenotypes and color patterns. And uh, it's just insane what you can do with a species of animals in almost 30 years. It's, it's great. Yeah. yeah, selective breeding is extremely powerful. Um, you know, these guys in the wild typically look pretty drab. Um, they're what we would call in the hobby a buckskin almost all the time. Uh, so a pretty patternless animal. Um, not a lot of uh, uh, what we would call good structure. So those really big floppy crests coming off the side of the head. They do have the crest, but they're much reduced. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, something that most people who get into crested geckos know is that just like most lizards, they can and do drop their tails, but they do not regrow them. And pretty much every single adult specimen and even some babies that they find um, in New Caledonia have dropped their tails. Um, mm. and, you know, it's a defense mechanism. And it's thought that most of them drop their tails in close contact uh, situations with larger gecko species like Rachidactylus lichianus that may be trying to actually eat them. So uh, that it's a it's a working theory. But yeah. The, the, the take home is, is, you know, in captivity, they're spoiled. They don't get scared as much. So it's a lot easier to have them keep their tails. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but, um, they're yeah I mean, pretty geckos, man, and yeah. And I mean, there's so many different, uh, what we call morphs. Uh, it's sort of a weird thing. You know, most of the reptiles that we work with in the hobby, we have a very good understanding of the Mendelian genetics that go into it. So basically, you know, genotypes or traits that we can mix together and then we have a really good idea of what we're going to get with crested geckos we do have some of that and we're starting to get more information on it but we have uh what we call a lot of polymorphism so you can take you know a couple of geckos and breed them together that look somewhat the same and you can get things that do not look the same totally different, yeah. yeah so um it is a little bit of a crapshoot sometimes um, but there are some well understood morphs out there that are very popular in the hobby. Um, we have things like the Lily White that was produced by Lily Exotics in the UK. Um, Lily White is super high demand, even still, even though it's been out for several years. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is what we call a incomplete dominant gene. So if you breed a Lily White to any other crested gecko, roughly half of the babies will come out Lily Whites of varying degrees, depending on the individuals that you bred together. Um, and another interesting thing about that trait is uh, you cannot do a super form. Um, you can, but you shouldn't, because when you make a super lily, so you breed two lilies together, it's a fatal trait. So they either, one, don't hatch, or if they do, they die very shortly after hatching. Yeah, it's a lot like, uh, whatchamacallit, like this spider gene and ball pythons and stuff like that. Yeah, like... spiders typically go and survive, but they have neurological issues. Yeah, right? This one is like completely fatal. Um, so there's, you know, a handful of other ones we have now we have, uh, Exanthix, you know, which takes away all the yellow pigmentation. So you get basically a gray and black or gray and white animal, um, which is really cool. Um, and there's some really good videos out there by a couple of other breeders as well as Pangea that really go into explaining, you know, the full on genetics and what we understand about them. I've been working with them now pretty much dedicating myself to them for a few years. And I still don't even fully understand all of the actual genetics. I just try to pair up things that look like they would go good together most of the time. Um, And I usually do pretty good with that. What about you? Yeah. I mean, cause it's a, it's a visual thing. thing What is Uh, it? uh, I was just saying, that's basically the same thing I do. I just try to, you know, pair up two things that look like kind of what I want. And then, uh, Hopefully, you know, yeah, babies come out <laughs> looking like I want, you know, yeah. just, you know, after you've had, you know, a few babies hatch and stuff like that, you kind of know what you're going to get. But until you, you do that first, you know, breeding or stuff like that, it's, it's definitely a cup. You just don't really know. Um, at least from my experience. Yeah, I mean, and that's part of the fun of it. It's always kind of like Christmas morning when you go and you, mm-hmm. you know, get that get that ha- egg hatch mm-hmm. from that pairing that you've never done before, and you're just, you know, fingers crossed, you're hoping that hey, it's going to be what you want, or it's going to be even better than what you want, you know, and then, Yeah, it's like I have some make good choices that come out with Dalmatian today. spots, and none of the parents have Dalmatian spots. Huh? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, yeah, I think that Dalmatian trade is really floating around in the gene pool at large. Um, I've noticed that a lot of things come out with spots when they're not really you weren't expecting them to. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. So Yeah. But um so I mean do we want to segue since you know the crested gecko and pretty much all the I other mean, I geckos guess, uh, we're gonna talk if CJ about. CJ just wants to pop one up. Pull one out. You gonna pull yours out? Yeah, do you want to show us your, your crusty? Yeah, your let's bring her back out. This is actually um <laughs> Funny story. This is actually my wife's gecko, and uh, if you want to be technical, the chameleon's hers too. But we're just really a, a animal loving home. <laughs> and, and what's uh, uh, what's this gecko's name? And what's her namesake? Uh, this gecko is named Jess. If you ever seen the show New Girl, you will have an appreciation for that name. Love that show. Oh, um, I love this gecko. If I can find her, come here, baby. Come here. Yeah, that's always the that's always the challenge. There she is. Come here, girl. Yeah, and actually, this there. gecko was produced. Nope. But don't do it. Don't do it. Other than uh, Gecko Galaxy. Oh, gecko yeah. Galaxy. It does look familiar. Oh, yep. Yep. That's definitely one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, there she goes. Yeah. So this one is a, this is an example of, you know, just trying to pick your best things and put them together. Um, it's 100% yeah, pin. Gorgeous girl. Yep, full pinstripe there with uh, what we would consider maybe some partial quad pinning even with that really nice pattern on the side. Um, and, you know, some of the some of the characteristic Harlequin markings, which Harlequin just refers to overall body pattern. So you're mm-hmm. going to have, you know, extra pattern on the legs and on the sides. Um, this pairing that produced this, as an example, is a, uh, a female. She's what we call frosted. I'm not 100% sure what that means, but she is a full pinstripe. She actually has a big ink blot on her tail, which is interesting. She doesn't have any other Dalmatian spots, um, and the babies so far haven't. But I got her from a local breeder out here, and then the male is a pinstripe with a lot of extreme Harlequin markings all over the rest of the body uh, from Pangea. So... I basically just got you know the nicest pins that I could get leap my of hands faith. on. <laughs> yep, leap of faith. That's what they do. Yeah, and uh, and this is what we end up with most of the time. Most of my clutches from that pairing will come out half and half, so we'll get a full pinstripe like her, and we'll get one that's what we call a partial pinstripe, which basically just means there's a small break somewhere in that pin that goes all the way down the back. Yeah, yeah. absolutely good. gorgeous little gecko. Looks like she's doing really good. Oh yeah, she's having a, good, a ball. <laughs> all right but uh as far as taking out the uh the gecko um goes i mean if we're going to talk a little bit about the care we can sort yeah, of let's just go into that, uh, yeah, some of the yeah, husbandry we, on these guys yeah because the husbandry for most of the geckos we're going to speak about tonight is pretty much the same there's just small variabilities so keeping these crested geckos um if you just want to start from the beginning let's say you get a baby i reckon it's probably because um, they're all from the same place yeah, ooh, it could be. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it could be. Um, I, this is how I do it, and uh, there's varying ways. Obviously, you can do um, different types of enclosures, but you know, you just want to sort of move up in size as your gecko grows. So when I hatch out a baby, I put it in a six quart, what we call a shoe box, which is modified with a little screen on front. Yeah, not and an actual cardboard shoe box. Let's get that out there. This is what it looks so like. So there's guys. no confusion. It's yeah, plastic. There it's got a bunch of plants and stuff, and it's cool. It's got a screen that's put in the front for ventilation. It's got a little little. I like to use the pool noodles because they make nice little perches and a I bunch of foliage in the back. So um, that's what I keep them in until they reach uh, probably three quarters of the size of the one you just saw that Charles took out. Uh, once they start getting about that big, I want to move them into something bigger, and I usually move them into about a 27 quart bin, which is taller. So. These guys are what we call arboreal. That means they like to climb, obviously. So you want to give them more vertical space than floor space because they're going to spend most of their time up. So I move them into a 27 core bin. And then, you know, adults can live in. If you're going to keep doing the plastic bins, which they do work very well, they're just not as aesthetically pleasing as some of the terrariums. Uh, you want to do probably like a, a 56 or a 65 quart bin, depending on how much space you really want to give. Yeah, and you can also do... Things like uh, exoterras. And, Absolutely. Uh, I yeah. mean, there's there's tons of different just custom enclosures out there. Oh, yeah. Do. There's options galore when it comes to it. You just want to make sure, yeah, that you're getting them the space that they need and that you're allowing for enough ventilation, but not so much ventilation that you don't get that humidity spike that you want every day. 
and we're achieving that in the the traditional way most of the time we're misting you know with water uh, once or twice a day at the very most if you have a lot of ventilation sometimes if you have a little ventilation you can get away with misting every other day yep yep and um their, their diet is super easy, too. Uh, when they're babies, they really like to take their bugs, and you should definitely give them bugs. I find that some of my adults, as they grow, they don't take the bugs as much. Um, but, yeah, they take bugs, um, and you want to do that once or twice a week, obviously dusting with calcium and vitamin powder as much as you can. And then they eat a formulated diet. There's a number of accepted ones out there. You have your Rapashi. You have your Pangea. Um, you have the Zoomed I've heard is, is, is pretty tried and true at this point. It's been out for a while. So those are good options. Yeah. Oh, and you were telling me the other day with your, uh, your calcium supplements, you need to watch out for, uh, what you, potassium, you said? Phosphorus. You, you um, Phosphorus. I don't know where yeah, that was. That was always the thing. I, I, I would be willing to bet that most of our calcium supplements available on the market are phosphorus free now. Um, but you know. Just be careful which one you buy. Honestly, the best one, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, is the RepCal Calcium with D3. Um, and I would get that, and I would get the RepCal brand Herptivite, which is just a multivitamin as well. Yeah. And you said so, with D3 or without D3? With D3. You want the D3 because um, nine times out of ten, that's the other thing we'll get into, and we've talked about this in many episodes, they're nocturnal animals. So most people, when they're keeping them, they're not keeping them with special you know, ultraviolet with, lighting. Yeah, with UV. You can keep them with UV, and there are many options available for like shade-dwelling animals, things that aren't going to get like 100% direct sunlight light all day um and i think if you can do that you definitely should but if you're not that calcium with the d3 allows them to absorb that calcium into their skeletal system properly um without having to manufacture their own vitamin d from yep. uv exposure and yep. they won't get what we call metabolic bone disease which is just an awful sort of it's like the chronic wasting disease of reptiles. I mean, their bones get all floppy yeah. and deformed. Yeah, the old, old their rubber sucks bone. out all the calcium out of their bone. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly they it. They become brittle and crack. And, I mean, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. But they're, they're an excellent choice for a starter reptile. Crested geckos are, I think. Other than the fact that they're not extremely handleable. I mean, as you just saw, they do like to jump and everything like that, but they're not a super aggressive um, and they're not dangerous in any way, obviously. Um, but the ease of care, keep them at room temperature, honestly works really well if your room temps are anywhere between like 73 and 78 even degrees at the most. Once you start getting above that 80 range, it gets a little funky. They don't really like to be that hot all the time. Um, yeah, I'll let mine get up to 80 with the room. Yeah. Just, but it's only for a couple of hours. And right, then right. To We're talking it. extended periods. You yeah, don't want to yeah. do it for you extended periods. Yeah. yeah, I keep my girl uh, between like 71 to 74, 5-ish throughout the day, whatever the room gets to. Um, and then she does see a dip um, in the high 60s at night. Um, and that's just basically because I'm keeping her in this newly modified beginnings of a reptile room. Um, right. And... It, right now, this room was originally designated for the chameleons, and that is that's chameleon all day, you know, uh, mid to midish seventies, and you know, let it drop down into the sixties at night. Obviously, we're not talking low sixties or anything crazy like that. Uh, but sixty-eight, you know, it's a that's a good fare. It's a few degrees cooler than seventy, yeah. seventy-two, yeah. seventy-four. You know, that's all. That's kind of ideal during the day. So. It actually works out really well for her. You can see she's extremely active when it's time for her to be active, and she she's loving it. She's eating good. She's pooping good, so I'm assuming she's eating good. I, I never yeah, see any licks in a, my Pangea, but when you put a cricket in front of her, KD bar the door. Yep. She's gone. Yeah. Going that's right a very important thing to mention if we happen to get any viewers at some point that are new to this, and they're going to – that's like the number one thing that I see – for new crested gecko owners, especially if they buy a small, young crested gecko, is they're, they're always, always concerned eating. that it's not eating. You have to take into account that the stomach in this animal is super tiny. So you can try to give it as small amount of food as you want, but almost any amount you give it is more than it can eat in a you know mm -hmm. day, a day and a half. 
So you're not going to see much, but that's a really good point. Um, I yeah, highly recommend poop. when you get a new gecko, do not put it on substrate right away. Put it on paper towel or some sort of a carpet, or a reptile carpet or something like that, because it's very easy to monitor whether they're pooping that way. If you stick that thing right into like a bioactive enclosure, especially, all that poop's going to get eaten by all your microfauna. And yeah, you're never, <laughs> never going to know. Yeah. But obviously, there's other things to look for. Does it still look healthy? Does it look active? Does it have any, you know, skin yeah, lesions? Check your leaves. Dead? Definitely check your, check your leaves. leaves. Yeah, check your leaves. Yeah, that poop. seems to be where they go because they're usually up and then uh, you know, I don't know up, uh, down all that. Yours, mine stuff. go right down the front glass. <laughs> yeah, they, you get that too. You do get that. Yeah, too. my my chameleon has a spot. There's like one spot on uh like a little piece of wood I have under I guess her favorite perch point, and it's just it's basically white. <laughs> Got to clean yeah. it every all the urine every day almost. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> all right. Yeah, so I mean, I didn't really do a step by step, but yeah, care is pretty easy. It's pretty basic. You're going to feed pretty much every other day some of that Pangea a couple times a week, give them crickets, keep them at room temperature, make sure they have some kind of a light cycle so that they know it's daytime and then the lights go off at night and they know that that's the time to be active. You know, keep your handling to, I would say, a, not a bare minimum, but a minimum. A lot of people do handle their crested geckos. Hey, Dom. How, how you doing, Dom? Bud? Thanks, Thanks for, for uh, tuning in, brother. Yep. And, uh, you know, just be careful with them. Uh, obviously, anything can happen. You know, if you have other animals, don't let them interact with those other animals. Uh, they can definitely jump and run up walls and up glass and things like that. So they can be lost easily. Yeah. Just, you and, know, and they yeah. do be get careful. I will they say, as they get older, uh, it seems yeah, I will like say, they do. as you're getting in to the hobby, uh, especially if you're going to, you know, keep things that eat bugs. You'll probably see this. This will probably be a part of your life. Little cricket carrier keeper thing. I got a, a reflection here. It's got these little night tubes. You can easily dispense your crickets, all that good stuff, your food and water. Um, don't do what I did, which is when I was setting up my chameleon, I had got the cage all set up and I was just rating the, you know, running back and forth, grabbing some stuff, setting lights up, whatever, whatever. And I had just not thinking about it, sat this next to the cage. So I sat it down and I go downstairs to go get my new fixtures because I swapped her all out with new fixtures and bulbs and stuff. And I come upstairs and I hear this like insatiable noise from the room and it's loud scratching and, and like hitting. And I was like, what is happening in here? And I, I had sat the crickets right there not thinking about it. And she saw them immediately. And she was yeah. down at the cage, just giving it hell, trying to eat all these crickets. She's trying to get through and get through. So if you do keep bugs, in that little container, which you probably will, especially if you, uh, you know, don't have a very high demand, like, you know, you don't keep a lot of animals. Don't keep them right near your animals. You drive them insane. Yep. You will drive them right up the wall. Mm -hmm. So something to think about, because I didn't think about it the very first, you know, the very, the very early moments of having this animal. And the next thing I know, she's trying to get, get completely out the side of the enclosure, bulging the screen out, put a little hole in it. This is rough. This is rough. Yeah. <laughs> yep that's a definitely a good point because they're you it's like that with with a lot of animals you got to think about where you're putting them and what they're going to be be able to see and be exposed to you know mm -hmm. if you have other animals or something a dog or a cat you know keep them things in a place where maybe they're not going to see those animals all the time because those are potential yeah. predators in their eyes so i mean and even other lizards oh for sure if you if yeah. you, you know when you, i was uh, keeping a species that don't like each other yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Was That's what I was just dragons, about to say. Yeah, I had all of my adults on one wall in my room so that none of them were across from each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they couldn't see Man, each other. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, bobbing at each other, getting all pissed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. They, they go yep. at it. But, uh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I think mean, that goes – I don't know. I don't even know if that applies just to new Caledonian species. I, I think that applies to any kind of new keeper, really. But uh, Yeah, for sure. But, um, but yeah, so keeping on with the theme of New Caledonia, the wonderful place with all the wonderful animals. Um, also, I read uh, they had the second largest barrier reef in the world. That's pretty cool. Really? Anyway. Huh? Yeah, nice. I read that. I, I hope that. it's I hope it's true, and it's not like the third largest because I'm going off just memory here. So, 
You Let's know, hope I, that's an actual I fact. I feel like my, uh, my, my advising <laughs> professor told us that the Belize barrier was the second, but he was probably he might have been mistaken on that one. Because <laughs> okay, okay. we were there, and I was it was cool. It's definitely not as cool as the Great Barrier Reef, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I really. <laughs> no, got, I hey, been. look, it's probably third now. I don't know. It just got demoted during this conversation. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> But, yeah, keep it up with the theme. Let's move on to Leeches, the big, lovable giants. You know, the new Caledonian giant geckos is, is one of their common names. Yeah. Um, it's going to be Rachidactylus leechianus. So let's talk about these guys. And I will say they have, in my opinion, probably some of the best patterns and, you know, therefore camouflage. I mean, these things are just – they're – camouflage machines that are invisible on the side of a tree invisible oh. yeah yeah chihuahua has got that going on who has got brother. that going too yeah yeah, they yeah. Got that going yeah. On, brother. arguably i would say chihuahua is probably even more than leeches but yeah it's, still, man, it's, it's a close like, race it's yeah. a close it, race oh for sure it depends on the tree too you know if it happened to be sitting on a tree that's got the same colors then the leechy might overtake the, of the, course. Uh, the you know like moss yeah <laughs> or, yeah like moss um so who's gonna (laughs) gonna jump into the lychees i don't know Uh, lychees is a species that i haven't actually had the pleasure of working with yet Um, yeah i have a very limited one of the largest but basically well i know the grand terra is the largest species yeah Um, yeah well that'd be more of like a locale um but yeah lychees as a whole uh are the are the largest yeah yeah, the largest, the largest. Geckos, yeah. yeah, the New Caledonian giant geckos is sort of an it's an example of what we call island gigantism. Um, in some cases, when islands are isolated like that, like New Caledonia is, it, it came off of you know the the old continent of Gondwana, like oh, eighty right. or hundred years ago. I gotta cut you off. I had to check it. It was killing me. It was bugging me. It's the third largest barrier reef in the world after Belize. <laughs> Oh, it is. Wow. Yeah. However, <laughs> however, it's the longest in the okay. world. Okay. Very so, cool. Yeah, you know, one cool. and then, you know, three minus one, you get second. So two, it's in there somewhere. Y'all work I, I, it. I, I, I dig it. Close. I dig it. I, I would love enough. I would love to dive it. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. I was in the I was I was close. I was like one off. So yeah, well, whatever. But yeah, oh, yeah. So, continue with what you were saying. Sorry, that was bugging. So when you know New Caledonia is, is a, a small archipelago that broke off of the the old uh, continent of Gondwana like eighty or hundred million years ago, and when that happens, and you get these isolated patches of, of animals and plants, you get a couple of things going on. You can get sometimes this gigantism, like we see in these geckos. You know, a particular line of these geckos that may have started out much smaller. Mm-hmm. You know, found themselves with a an excellent niche to be able to get really large and so that's what we see with the lichianus um we also see some incredible preservation of species of like of like flora there too that that get preserved that don't exist anywhere else which is interesting um but yeah like you said the grand tears in general Mm -hmm. are the larger of the locales that's gonna be your yeah that's gonna be your your main or or prime island locales, I've heard them called. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's going to be your main island. Yeah, locale. and I I did some looking because I honestly don't know a ton about all the locales. We go to these shows, we see these <laughs> things, and there's so many different ones, and we don't know. Yeah, them well, all. that's what I was saying. You know, about the beginning, of this pepper, just a little tiny pepper. Yeah, it's just it's all over the place. Yeah, they are. There are around six different types, according to what I found, and there are six different locales. Um, or sometimes we call them ecotypes. So these are just slight differences in the appearances of these geckos based on what isolated pocket population they're in and what the habitat is like there. Yeah, exactly. How Um, they've adapted to that specific habitat. Yeah, so there's several of those. You know, some of the ones you may have heard if you looked into lychees are like the yate, uh, the Mount Kogis or Kogis, maybe. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Yeah, um, motos. yeah, and then there are various captive lines of the Mount Kogis um, that are all different because they were, they've were they been selectively bred for so many generations within a particular collection you know, of these different breeders. Mm-hmm. So we find that as well. Um, but yeah, with the Grand Terre uh, ecotypes or locales being the largest, we get the insular island forms 
uh, which are the ones that are found on Pine Island, and then the smaller insular islands that are around Pine Island. Um, and there are several of those as well. Looks like around seven or so. Um, so, you know, and they all basically have names. So they're the, the sort of French names that were given to the islands, and then they usually have an island code that's just a letter. So we have like the, the New Anna or the Island G or the New Ami, which are some of the more common ones that we see, um, or the Island H. Um, we have the, the Moro or Island E. Um, and then there, there are several other ones, including just Pine Island, um, ones that are found on the main, the main part of Pine Island. Yeah. Oh, your mister going off? We can't hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's 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 so many of them. I mean, it's it's yeah. kind of hard to keep track of it. Yeah, and they range in you know, like we talk and we want to talk about size. You know, we're talking the biggest Grand Terre locales will get around 15 inches, and we're talking about hey, there's, there and there's lights. Gabe's lights. We synced them up. The mist right on the time. Lights. Yeah, man, I I can't help it. I will tell you what, one of these days, I'll, uh, I'll probably not. I probably won't get to actually change it. <laughs> yeah. They're so used to the schedule, so um, yeah. But we're talking like uh, you know, for the largest Grand Terre locales, we're talking 15 inches, and we're talking upwards of 400, even close to 500 grams in some cases. Big, big animals. Um, and then when we go down to the insular island forms, we're talking you know 12 inches at the most, and then we're talking two, 300 grams. Still a really large, really impressive gecko. Um, you know, another common name I've heard people call them is the pajama gecko because they get this really folded skin mm -hmm. and it almost looks like they're wearing a pair of baggy pajamas. Um, <laughs> they even have a little fold right at the base of their tail, which makes it kind of look like their tail is a regrow tail, but it's usually not. Most of the time they're not losing mm -hmm. their tail. So, um, yeah, they're they're really cool. Um, and, you know, like we said in the beginning, the care for them is extremely similar, if not exactly the same, to a crested gecko, except you're just scaling everything up. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're bigger. I mean, than with, with yeah, leech, your what your I understood with, them, with uh, Leechianus, you know, they tend to, you know, lay their eggs and stuff inside hollows. Right. Uh, yeah. And they basically live inside tree hollows. Yeah. Um, so that's why when you care for them and you have them set up, you want to have like a lot of uh, like cork bark and things like that for them to hide in yep. um, so they feel comfortable. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, everything, like I said, everything's just scaled up. Um, bigger enclosures, obviously when they're large, you know, and adults, they need bigger enclosures. Uh, they eat more food by a huge order of magnitude. You know, we were just talking about the fact that a baby crested gecko, you can't even tell if it's eating. Most of the time, from what I hear, a well-started baby Lichianus will eat, you know, if you give it a half ounce cup, they're about that big size of a 50 cent piece or so. And you fill it up, you know, a, a one quarter of the way, they'll eat all that food. And then okay. when they're adults, you feed them out of a two ounce cup, which is like three times the size and you fill it up to the brim and they'll eat all that food. Yeah, <laughs> they eat a lot. Yeah, uh, gargoyles are the same way. At least mine. Gar in my yeah, in my experience as well, gargoyles eat a lot more food as babies and even as adults than any of my yeah, crested gecko. The bowl, man. They do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So you mentioned are... earlier. Sorry. Yeah. No. You. Yeah. Go you ahead. mentioned earlier chihuahuas when we were talking about lychees. Uh, chihuahuas are, are arguably, I mean, very similar. Not not quite in size, obviously, but. Um, yeah. you know, to the, the everyday person, uh, you could put them probably side by side and not many people would just be like, that's a leech well, and that's like, a chihuahua. You know? yeah, I mean, yeah, they look I mean, different. They look different. I'm not saying they're the yeah. same, but oh, yeah, if you sure. see a always, chihuahua and then a leechy, it'd be very hard to tell them apart. Uh, oh, always the for the lay, yeah, always for the lay person, so to speak, uh, when it comes to these types of things, I've been in the hobby for you know, over 20 years, uh, no one can tell the difference unless they care about it, you know, and they've looked into it themselves mm -hmm. or they have some experience with it. And that's, you know, part of the point of doing these types of things is to get people interested and to make people care at least enough to know, you know, that, oh, that's cool. That's this is this thing. And this exists out there on this island. And it's the only mm -hmm. place it's found. And it's really cool. And I can yeah. also go to a reptile show and see them and hold them and, you know, and get to experience them. That oh, way. it's like the other day when I went to, to your house and I had a chance to get Finally, hold. I had never held a leech, uh, not a leechy, uh, a chihuahua for oh. I mean, ever. 
you know, and I just I had I didn't know that they hold on like they do. I mean, oh, yeah. It's insane. They hold yeah, on. They absolutely yeah. do. They what's your uh, do. What's your experience with your Chahu has been like, Nick? How you liking those? I love them. <laughs> I love. I absolutely <laughs> love them. I'll, I'm gonna. Me get too. One I yeah. Quick. Pick one. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead and grab yeah. one. Yeah. I adore Chahuas, and I adore lychees. But who doesn't adore lychees? It's like yeah, Chihuahuas are absolutely uh, massive gecko. They're definitely they're a species that I, I I would love to work with at some point. Uh, just yeah. with the variety and patterns and stuff like that, and, and colors that they have, you know. Um, yeah, they do. They. Uh, uh, I've noticed a lot with these chihuahuas too. They seem to have some kind of blushing going on. Okay, and of course, this this is my female. She's the more chill of the two. Um, of course, she's super fired down. Um, <laughs> there she is. Yeah, so she's not fired up at all. She gets way darker than this and has a lot more contrast. You know, their common name is the mossy prehensile-tailed gecko. Um, and they call them that because they, their pattern is so much like moss or lichen that's on a tree that in some cases it's it's unbelievable. It's, With, yeah, it's, it really yeah. truly is. And they get the little yeah. they get the little blushes on them almost that you you'd find and that's the um, you know in the lichen with the little fungi. Yeah, you know, yeah, they get that little kind of pinky blush on them. Oh man, it's it's incredible! Right. It's incredible. And then the prehensile tail. And, uh, why do they why do they call them prehensile tail? There's the they they literally wrap their up. tail around. Am yeah, I breaking I'm up, guys? Fully You're not. I mean, tail. And okay, I, I, lost hard, you. I lost you for about thirty seconds. Am I back? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, I'm hardwired in. Oh yeah, you're back. I <laughs> okay. No, oh, it's well, your I mean, whole. It's your whole screen was uh, frozen, not oh, your okay. audio. Well, I'm, I'm hardwired into the internet tonight, so oh, there she goes, leap of faith. <laughs> they all do that. That's a New yeah. Caledonian thing, apparently. But uh, it is. Leap of but, faith. Uh, yeah. Anyways, so what's what's the difference, you know, between these guys versus like he was talking about Alici? Well, um, if I had Alici to show you, I would do it. But um, they are, uh, you know really just different all around the the most similar part in my opinion if you're going to look really close at the face like that like if you just took a close-up of this one's face and you showed it to somebody who hasn't looked at a bunch of them you might be able to confuse it for a lychee but pretty much every other part of them is a little bit different um these guys gen she's chunky but they generally don't have the the kind of folds in their skin quite as much as a lychee does they're a little bit more slender bodied uh, they don't get as big as lychees, but they do get much bigger than crested geckos or even gargoyle geckos. Um, there's that little thing I was talking about right there, that little sort of fold right at the base of the tail. They do have a little bit of that going on, just like a lychee. Um, but mostly what you're looking at is just the build of them is different. Yeah, so, they're just more yeah, lanky. They're a little bit more lanky. Like I said, she's kind of a chonk. She she loves to eat. Yes, she uh, is a chonk. Yeah, so... I don't know what she's sitting at, but she's got to be in the mid sixties, probably as far as her grams goes. Um, and she's still got a whole nother year to mature before I can breed her. Uh, my male is ready. Um, and it's worth talking about. These are the ones that I have currently. I just have a single pair. Uh, there's two main sort of locales and types for Chihuahuas. We have the, the mainland or the ones that are found on Grand Terre. And we have the Pine Islands, which are obviously fine, found on Pine Island or Isle de Pines. Um, mine that I have were sold to me as Pine Island. I do believe that they definitely have Pine Island lineage. They are not as, they don't express as much of the phenotypic traits that the really high quality Pine Islands show. So what, what you tend to get with the Pine Islands is you get that really sort of true to life lichen look. Like it almost literally looks like there's lichen growing on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, they get what we call a white collar. So there's literally like a, plot, a splotch of white that looks like white or off-white lichen that's growing on the back. That looks like it's growing on the back of their neck. Now my male has a very light collar. She doesn't really have a collar at all. Uh, but she does get way more high contrast than this when she's fired up. Other subtle differences include just the overall build length of the snout, things like that. Uh, you're going to have a, a much more snub nose longer tail. On, your, on your main eye, on your mainlands. Yeah. Sometimes longer tails for sure. 
Um, and the Pine Islands tend to just be the ones that are more sought after in the hobby. Um, and they tend to bring, you know, not to, not to make it monetary, but they do bring more money in the hobby. Um, the ones that I have are the, definitely the nicest ones that I could get my hands on, um, but they are not like the super top of the line. Some of those really high end white collars go for thousands of dollars, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars. Mm. But uh, gorgeous for sure. Yeah. And again, the care is pretty much the same as how I would care for uh, a crested gecko. Uh, there's definitely some stuff in the herpetoculture literature out there that says that these guys like to bask more. So they would really appreciate having sort of a warmer spot to be able to go to, like right up at the top of their enclosure. Uh, the lights that I currently have on this rack do put out a little bit of heat. So I feel like that that's doing. Um, yeah. Dom just posted a question here. Uh, this is our buddy Dom. He's he's watching us tonight. Uh, he wants to know, can I explain what I mean by fired up? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, these geckos, like most lizards, can change their color to some extent. Now, uh, Charles has a chameleon. They are the wild example of being able to change their colors. They can do it with, <laughs> very quickly and with extreme accuracy, depending on how they're feeling. Uh, most other lizards will just sort of change from light to dark, depending on either their mood or whether they're basking and trying to absorb more heat. Uh, from that source. Uh, these guys basically do that. Uh, we find that when we miss them and they're in the dark and it's nighttime and they're active, they fire up. So see how light colored green she is right now. She does have some pattern that's showing through sort of some pinks and oranges. Yeah. She's this actually is... fired up a little bit since you pulled her. So she um, and she, out, and yeah. she will. Cause I have her out and that's enough to sort of spike that a little bit. If I wanted to really fire up, I would put her in one of those shoe boxes and just with a paper towel and just mist her a little bit and then leave her in the dark for like 15 minutes. And she would be super duper dark. All these pinks would uh, be more uh, pronounced. All the greens would be super dark green. And she even gets some really nice like mahogany browns on her too. So, yeah, yeah that's basically yeah, so what we're I'm talking about uh, mainly like a, like a change in, in pigment. Uh, now, I will say now while these animals don't really change their pattern, um, honestly, kind of like you said before, with the chameleons being the extreme side of fired up, um, I actually do notice pattern changes on this girl, but that, that's completely well, beside the point yeah. with um, especially New Caledonian species of geckos. I notice that when they do fire up and, and they do, you know, adapt the darker pigments and stuff like that, their patterns seem to express some more, if that makes yeah, sense. So, yeah, so you could hold a gecko, mm -hmm. like you could hold a, a chihua and be like, this is a very airbrush kind of bland green animal. And then it fires up and it looks like moss on a rock. Yeah, you know? they almost look and you like can, you can totally see there's a pattern in there, and then there's different colors and there's shapes, and you know the way it articulates yeah. on the body is, is a lot different. So I will yeah. say that even though firing up doesn't necessarily change the pattern, I, it can definitely intensify it. I believe it does. Yeah, a hundred percent. And Dom has a follow up question. So they fire okay, up more in the dark, opposed to the light with the crusty. No, they they really all all these species that we're talking about tonight seem to fire up more in the in the in the dark. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, usually after a good mist, when that humidity is spiked, that seems to really um, get them in the mood to be fired up. Uh, yeah, because so... they're all basically species of nocturnal geckos. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They're, they're, they're uh, active at night, so they normally fire up mostly at night. In right. the, during the day, if you go and, and there's... disturb oh. one in a leaf, use leaf or something like it that. It looks like we completely lost Maybe. Charles. So hopefully he'll be able to get back in. Uh, um, but the thing, the thing being too, is there's a lot of other variables that may or may not go into this and they can be, you know, investigated and they might have been investigated. I just haven't read the, the research. Okay. He's back. Let's add him in. There you are. What happened, bub? I don't know, man. It, <laughs> it froze up and my little uh, internet thing dropped to zero. So, Oh, I got you. Maybe I'm in the complete opposite corner of the house from the router, so maybe it's just not working uh, well tonight. Uh, yeah. But anyway, um, you know, you got to think because they're nocturnal, they're active at night, they're looking for food. They're not just looking for food. They're also looking for mates. They're also interacting with each other in the limited ways that they do. So these could be very well be visual signals for these animals as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and during the day when they're asleep, they just want to look like a blob of nothing on a tree or in a tree hollow so that they don't get eaten by something. So there's a lot of factors that can go into, you know, why or why not a gecko is fired up. 
Um, Sorry. On, I, just, on the, I hear ahead. geckos jumping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a normal thing. Yeah. On the on the subject of, you know, Chihuahuas and Leechies together and their slight differences from uh, crested geckos uh, being, you know, the, the staple of the industry. These guys, I know that they like to eat more bugs. So I offer them Pangea every other day, just like I do all my other geckos. But I find they don't eat very much of it. They'll usually eat, you know, just a little bit of it. And then, you know, every couple of days they get a nice big bug meal, whether it be some superworms or some dubias or some crickets. Um, and they love that. So that's that's a main difference between the Chihuahuas and the Cresteds for sure um, is the diet. And then when you want to talk about potentially breeding them, both lychees and Chihuahuas have their drawbacks. They're not as simple as Crested Geckos or Gargoyle Geckos. You can't just toss them together and things go wonderfully and then you get eggs a month down the road and we're all good. Yeah, you kind of – it's almost like mated pairs, right? Yeah, yeah. I have a pair. They've never been together. And there's very, every chance that at some point when I do go to pair them up that they could fight, you know, and, oh, and yeah. really mess each other up. So uh, it's always sort of a, you know, it's Fingers sort of a crossed. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that, that's crazy with the, with the mating. I actually wasn't aware of that uh, with the chewies and the yeah. leeches. Yeah. yeah dude, leeches um, and chewies will tear each other up if they don't like each other. You see, definitely yeah. got Well, uh, Gabe, we are, we are here, my friend. What's up? All right. Rachidactylus so... auriculatus. So gargoyle geckos. Gargoyle geckos. Let's, right, let's hear about them. Gargoyle geckos is a is a species. They call them what is it? Um, it's a you know it's another species of you know New Caledonian gecko. Uh, they're commonly known for the horns or mm -hmm. the, the you know spikes. The, the horns that they get, and that's what that's what actually gives them their name. That's why they call them gargoyle geckos. Um, um, uh, they're slightly, I would say they, it's a species that gets slightly bigger than a crusted gecko, at least from my experience. They tend to be a little heavier bodied than from what you would see on a crest. On average. Like yeah, there, there's a crest also, here and there that are bigger, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, well, they are in the, 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 so that, that's the new Caledonian giant genus right there. Yeah. But uh, they're also not not as good climbers, you know. They're they're pretty clumsy. They don't have the same like feet like you would expect on, you know, some of your other more boreal geckos. I guess you would say. Um, yeah, they're like they're like claw climbers as opposed to toe pad. Yeah, climbers. basically, uh, yeah. they're they're known to be found lower in you know in like shrubs and and like small trees and stuff like that. They're not. Uh, but I I can. Pull one out. Okay, let me see if I... Yeah, what about Hellboy? Where's Hellboy at? But let's let's hope that this one's fired up because if it is, it's going to be amazing. Um, he's not fired up all the way. Ain't that how it is? But uh, uh, man, I'm having a really bad internet night. I just I completely keep losing you guys. You keep freezing, and uh, you're frozen again. I think. Yeah, there you are. Sorry, guys. I'm going to try to resolve this yeah. on my own. This is a... Yeah. Cargo gecko. My light is, like, horrible in here. But, uh... Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me get a light. Sorry, my camera's up. So, anyways, this is my boy, Hellboy. He's not fully fired up anyway. But you can see that on top of their head, they have like these. It's, it's hard to get the angle right, but they have yeah, like two some like uh, bumps or nodules. Yeah, yeah, real pronounced humps on top of their head. Like, see it, and then you can also see that his feet. Sorry, I'm on the wrong. It's hard to see on this computer, but his feet don't have your regular like pads like you would see on like uh, like day yet. I'm not talking about like uh, on leeches and like, or leeches or crusties and stuff like that. Nice. They're more just just they got like little claws. So that's why I was saying that they tend to be a little more clumsy. God, sorry. He, this is my pride and joy. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, awesome, man. He's awesome. And so what uh what morph is he? What pattern so morph? He's what you call, let's see, you have like 
he's what you would call a blotch. Yeah. Um, so they have like more of like he's got like a reticulated pattern, just like a very like like net like pattern, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All over his body. And then basically in between that. Oh, come here, there it goes. We all got the leap of faith. <laughs> <laughs> we all got the leap in between three, that three for he's three. got like blotches. <laughs> Of like red and orange. I mean, he's just. Yeah, yeah, he's beautiful, man. Absolutely beautiful. Breeding <laughs> loan. But, you know, huh? I said breeding loan. They can vary a lot. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, they so they, there's a there's several different uh, or a few basically with gargoyles. Not quite as many with cresteds. What what are those pattern morphs that we get? So this with, is uh, gargs. There we go. There's that's a right. Thing. Yeah, female, and you see they can very just pattern wise. I mean, they can gargoyle geckos. I mean, they got all types of patterns. Yeah. Uh, in in the wild, what you would see. Oh, come here, girl. Another leap of faith. Four yeah, for four. <laughs> well, it, it's <laughs> nighttime, you know, so they're they're all super super well, the, excited. Yeah, they know that it's time for the lights to be off, so they're like, hey. Let's uh, let's do it. Uh, but anyways, sorry, I, I gotta close these, man. I don't wanna. Uh, but anyways, you know, obviously, what you're seeing there, those are more. You know, they've been selectively bred and stuff like that to produce the, yeah. those designer gecko, if you like will, that. and. Uh, yeah. But in the wild, they usually look more more drab, just kind of like you would see with like a like a crest. They probably have a lot more natural yeah. colors, something you know, something more to aid in camouflage. Yeah, exactly. Whereas we've bred them for our visual pleasure. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, but other than that, I mean, they're they're very simple gecko to to, to keep. Um, just like you would keep a crusty gecko. I mean, I basically keep them exactly the same way. The only difference is that I I give them more bugs than I would a, a crusty gecko or something like that. Um, That's interesting. My okay. gargoyles, they, yeah. they love it. I uh, find the opposite. Really? Uh, all, all the way across the board. I, I've had one gargoyle in my collection. She's still in my collection. She's my, one of my main breeders. She ate bugs when I first purchased her. For a while and then she just completely lost all interest and every single baby that i've produced in the last two seasons has not once eaten a bug they won't do it (laughs) (laughs) but they eat a lot of pangea a lot (laughs) yeah dude um, i actually buy crickets once a week and then pangea you know every like two days well my girl does i won't take credit for that. right yeah carry it around, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, talking about uh, talking about the feeding, it you just brought up a memory and i don't remember maybe i'm misremembering i don't know nick but i believe i've heard both of you say that you can actually um sort of mix up a little uh calcium supplement and you know sometimes these geckos will actually lap up the the mixed mm. calcium supplement is that is that a it's thing? a thing? It's a thing with some geckos. I don't really More know. like leopards or fat yeah. tails. I've never done it for any of my new Caledonians. I usually, even though the diets are balanced and they have a good calcium level, especially if you're using some of the growth and breeder formula mixed in there, I will usually once, uh, once or twice a week at the very most, I'll use a liquid calcium supplement in mixed in my whole batch of food uh, just to just sort of up that calcium a little bit. Um, you know, and dur- during the breeding season, it helps my females and it just, you know, helps everybody across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've never tried to put a bowl of calcium in for a new Caledonian. I don't know whether they would do that, to be honest. Mm, I don't know, man. I- I've noticed in mine actually don't like it when I put calcium on their crickets. It's weird. Oh, yeah. Fun oh, fact. Yeah. I've noticed that when I, um, uh, I dust my crickets for my chameleon, if I dust them too heavily, it seems like she can't get them. <laughs> Her tongue doesn't because stick. All, yeah, the powder goes all <laughs> over her tongue, and then she just retracts her tongue and knocks a damn uh, cricket on my floor. Or yeah. roach. I'm still working on the doobie roaches. She knocked Ooh. some of the gun out of the uh, out of the tweezers earlier. It didn't have any supplement on it. I reckon she just missed or something. I don't really know. But knocked it right out, and it started scurrying across the floor. 
Yeah, I had a moment. Be okay. I you might have screamed. I house. might have screamed. No, I didn't <laughs> scream. But yeah, I didn't scream. But man, it was close. I'm not a big, uh, not a big road person. I don't know. Yeah, no, me neither. It might take, it might take a little time for me to, yeah, no, nope. warm up to these a little more. <laughs> and you will things. just because you have these animals now. It's it becomes yeah. You ain't got a choice. Yeah. yeah. Now I got to be strong for my wife. That's what it is because you know these are, are her reptiles <laughs> and. She's like, how are you? How are you feeding the chameleon by hand? I was like, I'm just holding the cricket. She's like, how'd you grab the cricket? And I'm thinking to myself, I barely grabbed the cricket. And I tell her, (laughs) it's just the cricket. It's not gonna hurt you. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I was shaking like a leaf trying to grab this stupid cricket, (laughs) little thing. My bug. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know what it is. I'm not a My roach phobia used to extend to crickets. But you know, you know, our dad had the bait shop before we, I ever worked at a pet store, and we sold yeah. crickets for fish bait, and that was where I got over it because we had them in the same kind of thing that we did at the pet store. And now I, bin. I could just stick my hand in a whole vat full of thousands of crickets and let them jump all over me; it wouldn't be a problem. But one roach, yeah, I give that yeah. thing a wide berth. I make sure I got some. And, nice and honestly, tongs. if I'm being truthful. <laughs> And not so anecdotal. Um, the crickets don't bother me as much as the uh, as the roaches do. There's something different. About I, it. I'm all right with crickets. Every now and then, a really big cricket will make a quick move, and I'm like, "Ah, uh-uh, player, calm down." Yeah. But uh, <laughs> most of the time, I'm good with crickets. <laughs> most of the time, Come on, uh, man. I'm You're good way with bigger crickets. Than- I know, right? I could take a cricket, but favorite podcast man. moment. Thank you, Caitlin. That's <laughs> <laughs> loving it. All right, um, but yeah. So I mean, talking about so, uh, all these different species, you know, to just summarize, we've got you know a bunch of different species that you can care for in very similar ways. Just sort of tweak your care a little bit here and there. Um, you know, there are all... other species. Absolutely. That, there are a bunch I mean, of other species. Yeah. So many. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when we're talking about endemics in in New Caledonia, I mean, most of the, the reptile species there are endemic, which means they're found nowhere else. Yeah, uh, there are a like, handful like of small all geckos. Yeah, all come from yep. New Caledonia. Like, there's yeah. like 56 species or something like Oh, that. I don't know about... I don't know about 56 no, no, species sorry. of Rachidaclis. That's all of the species. Yeah, all of the reptiles. species. Yeah. Of... Yeah. 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 yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, you're good, but... uh I mean, there's some crazy ones, and they are kept in captivity. You got things like a rough-snouted gecko. Uh, it's Rachidactylus. Oh Trachycephalus, I think. You, I could be wrong. It might not be Trachycephalus. But they are super cool geckos. They have that sort of Rachidactylus look to them, but they get even bigger. Um, and they they don't lay eggs. They they give live they birth. Like hairs, yeah. They they give birth to two yeah. live babies, you know, once every month or two when they're in the breeding season, which is just insane. Yeah, uh, dude, that's... a live bearing gecko. <laughs> yeah, and then you got your yeah. chameleon geckos, your uh, your adactylodes. Um, they're really gaining in popularity in the hobby. Really small little geckos, usually on about yeah. you know, four or five inches tops, but really cool big sort of outline scales that almost make it look like they have like crocodilian like scutes on them they do they yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely a weird little gecko i mean and you yeah. that's another species you take care of them just like you do a crested gecko and yeah. yeah they're very very handleable so yes new caledonia yeah maybe we should workshop that the reptile throwing body. that onto a <laughs> thumbnail those are cool yeah oh, there's one on our uh, thumbnail yeah no there's yeah. not Yes, there it's is. Nice. Neither, neither of you have seen so it, little. but it's there. It's not that little. No, it's not. Yes, it is. In, case, really... in case our viewers couldn't tell, I usually do the thumbnails, and that neither of these two saw that there was a chameleon gecko on the thumbnail this time, but it's there, I promise. It is there. I my look. Th- my thumbnail game is evolving, okay? I'm, I do my very best. I feel like I do pretty good. No, I see <laughs> it. Bro, you right killed it. Middle. It's there. I couldn't make it out. I see it though. It is darker. I, it. I I needed a picture that already had a nice dark background, so I'm still getting better at cutting things out of their <laughs> backgrounds. So yeah. No man, you did great, bro. Yeah, cre- credit credit to National Geographic for that one. That was a that's a good photo. <laughs> yeah. Hey, also credit to our good friend over uh, over at Supreme Gecko, Wally Kern, because I realized y'all Absolutely. had a uh, a little bit of a thumbnail workshop the other day. 
Yeah, for sure. I was asking yeah. Molly some questions because he's a more experienced YouTuber, and I wanted to know specifically how he does the social media type post, which apparently is something called the community tab, which we don't currently have access to. So as our channel grows, hopefully we'll get that. But he we invited will get me that. to yes, he invited me into a stream with him, just a private stream where he sort of showed me how he goes about doing his thumbnails, which was really nice. Uh, Wally's just. Yeah. Really a super nice guy. guy, absolutely yeah. super. If you haven't checked it out yet, 12 Supreme Days of, of Christmas, Christmas are going on right now. Uh, he's streaming yep. uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, um, and Monday, Fridays. Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, except for the last Monday. week is going to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? I don't know. I, believe. I can't. No, I yeah, believe you could be right. You could be right. Um, um, and the time, yeah. the time is uh, eight, 8 Central. 8 p.m. Central Time is when he does, so 9 Eastern if you're on the Eastern Time Zone like we are. Um, hey, what are you doing? Hey, there he goes. Hey, look at Wally, that. We were just Wally talking. Roger. You know, Hey, you, Wally. You talk about him. There he is. Hey, Wally. <laughs> we were literally just but, giving you a shout-out. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's awesome. But, yeah, yeah, definitely. Anyway, make sure you check out the 12 Supreme Days of Christmas, everything going on over there. Um, from yep. you know, my knowledge is 100% donated from people like us in the uh, – in the – <clears throat> Sorry, in the hobby, so to speak, and it's just a really uh, he says all bad, I'm bad, sure. I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, and it, it's a really great thing. No. Um, you know, <laughs> Wally and uh, his wonderful wife Nanette have done a really great job of this, and it's it's getting better by the episode. So make sure you check that out for sure. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to go back but, and rewatch um, tonight's I, I, stream know, after this because uh, I was only able to watch the first few minutes because we had to start. So I'll definitely be doing that. To be selfish and tough. Ignore my next comment, he says. Okay, we will do that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, again. you're okay. Oh, you lost us? No, I'm good. I can see you guys just fine. He's just having some connection Yeah, I like the... Uh, I think you're going to need to yeah, move your I don't, I don't know what's happening. Um... Yeah, I don't understand. I've never had this issue. Here we are, six episodes in. I've never, I haven't had this issue yet. But uh... yeah, but um, yeah, we're getting to that hour mark, um, and I feel like we did a pretty good job covering pretty much what we wanted to cover. So we gonna yeah, it was definitely this is simple. move towards the wrap up. Yeah. No. So here we are. Uh, another uh, another wonderful evening spent with uh, my my good friends here. Um, that's everything new Caledonian guys. If, uh, we didn't elaborate on something you wanted to hear about, or you would like to know more once again, um, uh, please don't be afraid to comment and let us know, let us be your, your research outlet. If you can't find something, we can definitely do our best to help you out with it and, uh, make sure you like and subscribe the channel. We need every bit we can get. Um, we do have some really great friends in the industry, namely being Wally. And, uh, we, we would love for you to come over and like us and subscribe to us, but also make sure you check out Supreme Gecko and everything he's got going on right now. So without further ado, oh, one quick Next thing. week. Guys, we no, about next week. Uh, you thought I was going to forget. Yes. You thought. <laughs> no, next week, uh, we have a really, uh, a, a really big podcast coming up next week. We have another interview podcast coming up, and uh, it's with uh, no one else than Bill Strand of the chameleon academy i am personally yeah. through the moon excited for this podcast bill strand uh for those of you who don't know um he's you know started the chameleon academy which is an insane source of knowledge for all things chameleon um you go to his website it's almost set up like a curriculum there's modules you can take online and uh, he's got podcasts on apple Podcasts. he's got a youtube channel at chameleon academy so make sure you check all that out yeah, and um, Apple, if you have anything you want us to ask him, please let us know in the comments. We'll make sure to get it yeah. in there, and we're going to be talking to him. Uh, once again, I am so excited. Uh, just oh, yeah, getting into ecstatic. the chameleons. Uh, yeah. th everything this man stands for is awesome. I love the knowledge, and I love uh, the ease of access he's provided. So definitely we're really excited for next week's episode. So that's going to be at 930 live Eastern time. You guys know when it is. This is uh, the Reptile Hangouts podcast. And uh, once again, we're hanging out. You're hanging out. This is Reptile Hangouts, guys. Have a wonderful weekend. We will definitely see you next week. All Thanks, right. everybody. See ya.
See you next time.